Excuse me. Good evening. Um, my name is Karen Oresti. I'm here in uh, two capacities. One is director of administration for St. Louis County, and the other is chair of the St. Louis County Human Relations Commission. Um, <clears throat> this is the eighth or ninth in a series of listening sessions in support of the um, research writing and implementation of a plan of equity for St. Louis County. And tonight's topic is a welcoming St. Louis County. Before we um, get started and uh, I introduce our staff, let's um, um, do the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> so let me um, uh, introduce my colleagues here um, tonight from the um, uh, Diversity Office, the Acting Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, um, Kenneth Murdoch and his um, administrative assistant, uh, Ms. Theta Person. And I will uh, turn the program over at this time to Mr. Murdoch for the introduction of guests and uh, the agenda for tonight. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, tonight we have speakers that will be, that we are encouraging to give us both ideas and a vision for what a welcoming plan for St. Louis County could be like. We're looking for a welcoming plan as equity in action. So any ideas you have or any concepts you want to share should be towards that end. How can we make St. Louis County more welcoming to new citizens, <laughs> more welcoming to people moving to this area? And how can we do it in a way that builds equity? Tonight, we have several speakers from different stakeholder organizations and from the St. Louis community in general. And please understand that the ideas are coming from the speakers and this listening series is simply that. It's a listening series to hear ideas that we're going to put in the equity plan to try and push St. Louis forward and build greater equity. So our first speaker tonight is Elizabeth Cohen, and we're gonna let her uh, tell you a little bit about herself, and then she's gonna talk about uh, welcoming. So Elizabeth, uh, you have the floor. Would you like to uh, please go ahead and start off? Uh, can you put my presentation there? Uh, I think you have to hit share. Uh, Rob, do you have it by chance? I don't have the presentation. I made no. I made Beth. Betsy the presenter. Yes, so she should be able to share it herself. Are you able to do that, Betsy? Share from my screen? Yes. Yeah, on the bottom of your screen by the, your your uh, video button and the mute button, there's a share button. When you click on yes. that share button, it then grab WebEx. At the, at the top left-hand corner of your screen, it says file, edit, share. Yeah, you know what? I'm just gonna talk it. I'm not gonna use the presentation. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm just well, going to tell you what email, you can email us the presentation. We'll she, put did. I she did. did. I did. That was why I thought you would she be did. it. Um, Let me so, try to get it. That's fine. Um, I'm happy to just share some of the data and just explain. So the Mosaic Project, I'm the executive director, which is part of our World Trade Center and the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership. And our goal is to attract and retain foreign born people to our region. So in a sense, we are that arm of our city and our county to market the region, attract people, and then connect them to the right resources. And we need to have the right resources so once people are here, then they feel supported in what they do. We have been growing our foreign-born population, and after the Mosaic Project was started in 2013, we were growing our foreign-born population until such a time as under the prior president um, was very restrictive on immigration, um, and had a lot of negative aspects for international students and refugees, and then the pandemic. So it was declining. And then we now have been in a growth mode again, um, but our overall region has not been growing. And you have seen all the news. Um, that's not mine. So if you can just take that down, please. You can take that, yeah. Yeah, not I'm trying problem. to grab hers. And so basically our region, and you've seen it in the news this past week, is we used to be the 20th largest region and we've fallen out of that. Um, and part of it is because our native born black and white populations have been declining and our foreign born has not grown enough to overcome it. 
And really, you need to be growing your base population at the same time as we would be growing our foreign-born population. And what we have seen in the county is the growth has come from foreign-born people. And now that we've just fallen below a million in population for the county, this puts many things at risk because we don't have population growth, we won't have a tax base growth, we don't have workers, and we don't have younger families. The data for the region shows that our largest foreign-born population right now is our Indian foreign population. And that's because of our education base in the region, our eds, our meds, our science, and that is definitely true in St. Louis County. Second is Mexican, third is Chinese, fourth is Bosnian. So while we do have a Bosnian population, um, often in the south part of our county and has continued to move west and south, um, they're not the future. The future is going to be Indian, Chinese, and Hispanic. And so what's important to know is that this is the growth engine for our region. And so we need to think about programs and accommodations. Um, you can just keep it down. Okay. I'm just addressing the key points. Okay, thank you. It's not a problem. And so the point is our Latin population, if we could grow it and have a Latino population such as Nashville or Indianapolis or Columbus, we would go back into the top 20. If we could get our Asian population growing, we would get back into the top 20. And so what is most important? I work with Welcoming America, which is a national organization, um, and we see many areas around the country that have welcoming plans in their government. They are looking at the languages of their top groups that they want to attract and having materials for language access, which is actually a federal requirement if you have federal funds, and we right now have a lot of federal funds, and you, we could have legal action against us if we do not have language access. That's very important, and it will also be important as we look at our newest refugees that are coming from Afghanistan and now increasingly in the next three years, we may have refugees from the Ukraine. Language access is number one. There's a lot of work that's been done that I've shared with Karen. The Immigrant Service Provider Network has a committee, the International Institute, there have been meetings held on this, but the action for the RFPs from health and from education, from COVID has really not gone forward. The hiring in the county needs to reflect the population and should be incorporating people from these ethnicities. Appointments should look to reflect these ethnicities. Information from Welcoming America and other governments, they have a certified welcoming program that regions around the country have done, and it can be used as a template whether you choose to really go through the certification or not. We can work with you to look at what those criteria are. And the various regions such as Columbus, Dayton, Nashville, Memphis, they've all embrace this with their government organizations and their counties. Montgomery County, which has a large foreign born, but Columbus, Dayton, Nashville, Indianapolis, like ours, are similar, and they all have embraced their governments taking more active stances than we have to welcome and grow the foreign born population. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, are there just, any questions from I just, I'm just curious for the, um, uh, and thank you. Uh, and agree on all of it and um, figuring out how to kind of do it all at one time, um, but but not rush into it because I worry about rushing into it. <clears throat> um, is Welcoming America, because I haven't looked at the program specifically, are, is, it, is it something that arcs over a period of time? Um, and is it is it a multi-community uh, collaborative, in other words? Because I think um, that's going to be important too. Any individual, and that's one reason why we have not taken it on from Mosaic's point of view, because you need to work with every different entity. Okay. And to try to say, do we work with the county? Do we work with the city? It, you know, they have standards that include how are your schools welcoming? How is your police welcoming? How are your first responders welcoming? How is your language? What are about your health communications? And so, because of our fragmented region, it is not something that I could take on where um, other regions have unified governments where you can look at the whole entity. But the standards can be looked at, the criteria can be looked at, and yeah. it is very, um, and they're also gonna be modifying it to some more of a stair-step approach, but it's going on all over the country and it's very well accepted and our, the county and together, we could look at those steps and whether you choose to go for the certification or just look at it as a guidepost, it is there to help us and we are members and it's something that we're very willing and motivated to help and do. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I have and, and, and that could encompass all of the language access. I mean, it's all the different layers. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank My, you. Betsy. 
My question is about the language access kind of, and I want to stress that point because I think that's a central point for tonight that one, you said federal funds, when federal funds are there, and St. Louis County does have federal funds, there is a responsibility to have certain uh, language access. Uh, could you expand on that? And also the second point is, uh, you said Indian, Mexican, and Chinese are going to be some of the expanded communities. But Chinese, Indian, and Mexican, all those could be people with multiple languages. Uh, that's not just one language. So doesn't that once again reinforce the need to have an expanded language program so it could touch people in different languages? Yes, um, it does. And that's, you know, again, we would look at it carefully, but I think the um, Immigrant Service Provider Network and the International Institute can tell us the actual languages that the populations need the most. So many of the Indian people, again, here speak English as well, so that's not an issue. But as we get into Spanish, that is very important. And then in our Asian community, and now that we have Dari um, and Pashtu for our Afghan community who are increasingly moving into Afghan and Bayless, I mean, we need to be saying, how do they have access, at least for the most important documents that right. span the issues? Right. I, I really like to say, at least for the important documents, because court documents, tax-based documents, even medical documents, it's very important that people can understand those in their primary language, because that's the only way they can really serve that emergency need. On the other hand, we can't let the perfect stop the good and to start on three languages to start in anything. And I think the immigrant service provider network has a whole committee working on this and they are standing ready to um, guide. So is it fair to say what you would be looking for would be a co-commitment from St. Louis County to make sure we expand language accesses and really dive into the nuance of need for language services? Yes, and work with the immigrant service provider network and the International Institute and have RFPs for the most important areas to begin working on several of the most important languages for the most important areas of need. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank Karen, you. Do you have another question or any uh, other of the uh, accounts? No, I'm, I'm just quoting that uh, can't let perfect stop the good. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> uh, any other committee persons from the HRC that have a question they want to register at this hey, time? Caroline, uh, we can welcome uh, uh, Human Relations Commissioner Caroline Fan. Evening, Caroline. I think she's still okay. Muted. Well, she's she's uh, getting her audio together, so there you go. Uh, and I, I had okay. a question. Um, I just wanted to see if Bessie can can um share what makes a language mo most important. It would be by the um percent of our population, not just born born, but families that are in that community. That have the need for it and those that are particularly underserved and need the um, resources to be accessed because they're not necessarily um, able to use or access in English and they don't necessarily have trusted people who can translate for them. You that question actually spurred another quick question which says, uh, so as we build language, isn't it also important to build trust in those communities? as they come in, because some communities might feel, they might be trauma communities, they, uh, certain people coming from. Well, that's, that's why I mentioned hiring people that reflect our community. And I know that when County Executive Page had a press conference uh, several years ago in Spanish, he had leaders of our Spanish community with him because they are the trusted communicators. And many of the people who come from other countries don't always have trust in their government. Um, but when you have leaders of the community, and whether that's Jeffrey or Sal, when they stand by the sides of government and share it, then you have built that trust. Trusted communicators, that's a key word for me. And I like that very much, thank you. Okay, uh, with that, if there's no more questions, we're gonna move on. Thank you very much, Ms. Cohen, for your presentation tonight. Our next presentation will be Sal. Sal. Okay. Sal, How you doing, Sal? Really good, thank you. It's a pleasure meeting everyone tonight uh, in this meeting and it's it's always a pleasure to meet uh to share the space with uh, my friend betsy cohen and, and i believe jeffrey Sointet. uh so uh, thank you for the invitation now i do have a file to share so I, i'm in share so i just click on file i'll see what oh, happens there. Yeah. okay 
I hit share and let me see if I can find it. Uh, so pardon me while I go through this. Uh, this county. Oh, desktop. Okay, uh, desktop. Find it. It'd be right here. Webex. Well, there we go. Sorry for the uh, for the delay. Attention. Um, Don't um, see the image yet, Sal. Uh, did you share the screen at the bottom of the Webex first? That should bring up your computer screen for everyone. It's loading up right now. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it yeah, Sal. We're, Yes. You are the presenter, Sal, so you should be able to share whatever you, whatever you're ready to share. Okay, so it's uh, share. There you go. Okay, and it was just loading up. So there we go. Thank you very much again. Uh, just a couple of comments uh, in my my presentation is going to. Uh, briefly touch on both DE&I, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, our, as it interrelates, it's, it's part and parcel of the uh, discussion around welcoming communities. Um, so I am going to, uh, now I'm going to, um, do. how do I move the screen to our, our technology expert? How do I go to my next slide? The arrow keys on your keyboard should let you advance, or you can use the uh, panel over on your left side of the screen there, where I believe that will take you through your okay, slide so, deck. And I apologize. Uh, uh, so say that to me again, if you would. So where, sure. where do I go? Where do I go to? to if you if you just click inside your presentation to anchor your cursor, you should be able to use the arrow keys on your keyboard uh, to advance through the slides. Um, I know that's one way that will work. Next, right. I, I click next. I uh, I'm sure contact no. It appears you also have some on screen controls that are displaying over on the left side of the screen. Perhaps you can go. I'm not exactly sure what that. What that menu bar is there. You uh, go. There we go. I'm sorry about that. So diversity, equity, inclusion, just a few comments. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is who who's in the room equity ask uh, who's trying to get into the room. And and inclusion ask has everybody been hurt? So I think we're going through that process right now. But I do want to make a the quick distinction between what e equality and equity is. Equality is giving someone a shoe, and equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. So the comments that Betsy led into uh, right now in in the discussion that we've got going on is making sure that in the, as we become a welcoming community or implement a formal plan that everybody's at the table and uh, and that we're very clear about the populations that we're talking about the community that we want to be. And so I've uh, the next few slides are going to be data driven and I'm, I'm very strong about data driven because I, I, I it it just makes absolute sense. Uh, I know Betsy has some data to share, so I'm going to supplement what she said. So data driven, but you also have to be very careful about that that the data is both diverse, inclusive, and equitable because uh, it, I recommend the approach of using race, ethnicity, culture, and language as the data. And you have to dig into the data. Uh, there are some cases where we see, the, for example, uh, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit on the opioids crisis. Uh, the the disparities were because uh, in COVID and in uh, both COVID and in uh, uh, the opioids crisis in particular, you would think 
that the problem is just black and white. It's more diverse and more complex than, than oftentimes uh, uh, it presents itself in terms of just focusing on race. And uh, here's a welcoming uh, community sample vision statement. And this happens to be from the Kansas City and, and I'm sure we can get uh, 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 other uh, uh, other examples or best practices uh, from um, from other sources. And we'll go go that go into that as we continue the discussion. I'm sure this is going to be the this is not going to be the last discussion. So this is uh, here's the vision, here's the, uh, the the vision and the mission statement. The basic thing is we want to. Uh, it is good for our region. It is good for our economy. It is good for everyone when we have a welcoming community where uh, 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 people can come here from other parts of the world and, and thrive and be contributors to uh, everything that we do, okay? Um, so I can see the uh, slides. Just tell me the next one when you want me to. Oh, I got it. I got it. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, so welcoming best practices that uh, 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 Betsy mentioned, and uh, these are active links, so I'll share it and you can do with it, or we can talk more about the best practices, but the source is the Welcoming America and the New American Economy. And, the, and I, I believe that's the uh, St. Louis Mosaic Project has led based on, on, on this, the models and the resources uh, uh, from, from, this, uh, from this organization. And uh, so, where are we as a county? How do we presently look? And I think we are a great community to be in uh, simply because if you, you look at different uh, uh, indicators of where we are as as far as a place to live, it's outstanding. It, our St. Louis County is an uh, excellent community to live in. And this is from the county health rankings. It ranks in the top percentile and type, types of being the the healthiest, and trust me, there are some counties around the the the, the nation and in St. Louis that don't go anywhere close to where uh, St. Louis County is in terms of of, of health. Um, so you have to you again going back to the data driven, as you can see from this slide from the 2020 census, we're a very diverse community, maybe in lar not large numbers. Uh, uh, in terms of the total population, but these are important communities that contribute to our, our, our again, our, our economy, our, our culture, our everything that, that goes on in the county. Um, so, uh, I, again, this is another slide showing where uh, the, uh, the uh, foreign-born population comes from. But this is this is an overview. It's much more complex. In talking, speaking of data, uh, look at the African. We have six thousand four hundred fifty-three uh, African from different areas of Africa that are living here in St. Louis. But when you look at the data, unless you, you peel the potato or the, the the onion a little further, you won't get the complexities of how uh, what our region truly is. And in terms of Africa. If you only use race, they will show up only in the black or African American data. So you don't get the richness, the complexity of our region if you if you do not dig in far enough. And the same thing for the Bosnian community. In in St. Louis County, I believe there's 60,000 or more Bosnians, but they're lumped into the white community. Uh, now, St. Louis County, uh, and I pulled this piece of data out because we were talking about families, so that includes children and adults. And, and currently, and now in our, in our county, uh, the, there are some points that we need to worry about and for trying to figure out, well, if we're going to be a welcoming community, there's some work to be done here right now with the community that lives in our county. And as you can see in the Black, Hispanic communities, uh, specifically in our uh, American Indian and uh, Native Americans and Alaskan Natives, there's there's pause for concern because the children in poverty uh, are it, the, the rates are quite high. Uh, the uh, 
there, the other demographic trend that we have to pay attention to, in, in, I don't have it in terms of the county, and certainly I'm sure we could, working with our, and again, going back to the what Betsy said about collaboration, it takes everybody. It takes every uh, institution, every uh, uh, governmental in the, uh, 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 in, uh, unit to, to, uh, to get the data and, and focus on their specific, what, what this uh, concept means to them. And uh, here are the demographic trends for children from kids in Missouri, and I believe it was generated. And it needs to be updated, but the trends are still there. And as you can see, uh, the bottom bar is our white community in our schools. And I think this is gonna be reflected in, in, in the schools in, in our region that from 2010 or 2000, 2015, 2000, and projected to 2030, 2050, these are gonna be the students in your schools, in our schools. So the biggest drop is in the white community, the biggest growth in the African or, or in the uh, um, uh, Latino community, uh, the African American community takes a little bit of a drop, but there's gonna be continued growth in Asian and other communities throughout the state of Illinois, uh, state of Missouri. I'm sorry, I take that back. I hope we can erase the, my comment there about, about Illinois. It's Missouri we're talking about. So this is important, uh, uh, important data because it gives us not only the numbers of, of, of students in our schools and the diversity in our schools, but this is also the future workforce. This is the future workforce. So it has implications for our workforce. Uh, and uh, again, we cannot overemphasize enough, and you're gonna hear this over and over again from the immigrant service providers, from the International Institute, all of the organizations that are direct service providers with, uh, in the, uh, with, these, uh, with our ethnic communities, that, uh, that there are English plus, as was pointed out, most of us do speak English, but there's a significant number of us that do not or have limited English skills. And so, um, uh, so again, consider the use of race, ethnicity, and language-driven data and to use this data to create effective uh, community engagement because data does nothing. Plans do nothing without action. And so you have to uh, uh, have these uh, engagement uh, programs and driven by data and, and if you, you uh, the key thing to this is not only do you have to know who the people are, but you also have to know your messaging. And the messaging has to match the audience. And so it can't just be English, and it can't just be one or two languages, it has to be comprehensive. And I think uh, if you, when you look at uh, the Title VI, again, related back to the federal funding, and we're required, <laughs> We are required to provide language access plans, public facing language access plans, and then not only do that, uh, but, but be accountable to, to show that, that, you, that there, there is uh, outcomes, that there are outcomes that you could measure over periods of time. So the, 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 the uh, role of race, ethnicity, and languages is critical to the welcoming communities concept. Um, there are at least 42 other languages uh, spoken in Missouri. And so what we need to do is figure out what languages there are in our county. And, and, and again, that's data that can be gotten uh, from, from the census and other sources to talk about, to at least develop a language access plan. Um, now here's a model, designing a language access plan. And, and at the center is effective language access policy directives and implementation plans. And you can see all the, the, uh, the components that, uh, that make up the plan. But again, the main driver is Title VI, uh, language access. And then the other part is understanding and, 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 uh, and including uh, the social determinants of health and the, uh, the, the barriers to health care, uh, including health and mental health care. Because if we're talking about uh, a welcoming community, then we also want to continue in the path that we're at right now with St. Louis County being ranked as high 
uh, uh, for healthiest communities. But what is that going to mean for people that do not understand the culture, the mechanisms of government, our institutions, and 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 they are going to need effective communications. You know, I've uh, once in a while, every once in a while I get I get to, to Betsy's point. I, I recommend that you all consider something along the the uh, uh, the. Uh, the lines of a DNI inventory for your organization, uh, for the county government, uh, because uh, to to Betsy's point, if uh, uh, if it doesn't include, if it does not truly uh, reflect the uh, the diversity in our community, then then we're going to have the same issues that we did with the opioid of, with the uh, COVID crisis, and we grab we worked hard in partnership. Me, Betsy, uh, Gabriela Ramirez, uh, 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 Blake Hamilton, Diego Avente from Casa de Salud, because you did not have the staff. You did not have the staff to 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 do this, and so we, you cannot rely, especially in a pandemic, on just the 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 time and effort on volunteers from our community, communities that are stretched with their resources to do the work that that quite frankly, is the responsibility for a Department of Public Health or other departments. So, so again, uh, you know, uh, uh, when I talk to folks, uh, I get invited to talk about DNI. I said, look, I looked at your vision statement, your vision statement, you embrace diversity. But unfortunately, I look at your, your, your top staff, your administrative staff, your staff uh, that's uh, doing the work uh, and you are neither diverse, equitable, and inclusive. And I hope that's not the fact of the county, but I think if you're going to take this seriously, you're going to have to take that, you're going to make, have to take the step of seriously, seriously examining where you are and versus where you want to be. So, um, and change. This is about change. And you know, there are people in our community who may not be, uh, is, as open as we are in our discussion right now, and there are going to be people that are going to have do a pushback on this. But there are ways to frame it, and you do it by being intentional in your actions. So you have to evaluate the past, present, and future, build relationships based on mutual trust and respect, and to work the purpose to work on issues of mutual concern. If you don't have that trust and respect, if you don't have people on your staff that reflect their communities, and the next step, which is the collaboration, is almost impossible. And network with everybody. So collaborate, network with those communities, with your trusted partners, uh, people like you have today at the, the panel, and, 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 and embrace and manage the change that is necessary for us to be truly uh, become truly a welcoming community beyond what we've already done. And I congratulate the work of Betsy and Jeffrey and the county and the city and in, in uh, of of the, doing the initial steps, but additional uh, additional programs, additional initiatives uh, grounded in data. Are truly needed, and I, I I commend you for for tonight's workshop, and I I look forward to continuing this conversation down the road. So thank you very much. That's that's my presentation. Can I add one thing to Sal's comment? Please go ahead, Betsy. Um, you know, one is his comment about ethnicity, not just race, is really important because, for example, our Syrian now all of our Afghan arrivals, um, you know, they'll they'll be classified as white. Um, yep. So again. It, it, it's complicated, but you need all those different layers to reach this growth. And I will also add that Mosaic has built a network with um, basically 108 Mosaic ambassador schools, um, many of which are county schools, and um, which would dovetail to what the education role is within our county. Um, and we also have Mosaic ambassador companies. We have Mosaic ambassadors. We have pro so we have done a lot of this work across the region with a lot of it happening in the county. And so those partners are there when the county is ready to want to connect the dots with us. 
Yeah, and Betsy, and I, I'm very proud of my mosaic pro, uh, mosaic project ambassador sash. It's in my closet right now. I could have worn it to this presentation, but but truly, truly a great program. All right, thank you both. Uh, any questions from uh, committee members? Or... No, I, I appreciate Sal's information, and I'm I'm very familiar. I I um. I think one of the challenges we have is in being a governmental institution are the restrictions on how we operate and how we bring people in and how we contract with folks and who are the providers and whether or not there are um, certified providers who can can make that process easier. Otherwise, the, the need to go out uh, by ordinance and use the RFP process to bring in the necessary contractors is a um, is an unfortunate structural barrier to moving this along faster than I'd like to, but, but the intent is certainly um, there and I, and I hear what Betsy said about the fragmentation and, and I, um, I mean, I'd like to think that the county and the city and all the folks who've been part of your uh, partnerships. Um, and that includes um, everybody here, Jeffrey and Aaron and everybody it includes the. The, the willingness to create a very large table, because we are talking about community change. So you can't not have everybody at the table. Um, I just got to figure out what that looks like. Um, and I think in terms of um, the mandates from from uh, Kenny's office as well. Um, could it look like something that the county's never even tried before? And the answer is it'll have to have no choice. So I, I think you're right, Karen. I think you have to look at the institutional barriers, it's not just the staffing, but the institutional barriers. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Our communities are, are taxpayers and and uh, some of them don't ever get those that tax money that they get paid in. And it's discouraging, especially in a pandemic, when you're asked to come in and consult uh, for, uh, for a department to deal with the COVID. And and it, it becomes so apparent to you when you hear the responses we have subcontractors. Well, dealing with some of those subcontracts, they were not qualified to do the work. So who's doing the work for them? It's um, the volunteers from the community. So there, that is inequitable. And so that's not acceptable, right? Absolutely, it's not acceptable. So uh, so I, I hope these are some hard discussions, and I'm not. I'm proud of my relationship with the county. I love the people that I work with. Dr. Sam Page has my utmost respect, uh, his staff. Uh, I could come out with a list of the people that I work with, but we're all struggling with the, uh, the, the structural, the structural institutional uh, barriers that, uh, that, that, that contributed, contribute to, uh, uh, to to comprehensive meaningful change that's good for the whole community. Yeah. Sal, you said something in this presentation that I really want to emphasize more. The building relationships and the networking part. Uh, I think there's two parts. I think there's the need to network in the community and talk to the community at large because I want to kind of change some of the tones around what community uh, members paradigm immigration and let people know that immigrants bring better opportunity. And as they come in, there's more opportunity for us. I think there is on some level, uh, people who misunderstand immigration and what it can do to make this community better and how bringing more people in can make a diverse population can help St. Louis County. Um, but well, that, go ahead. Absolutely, Kenny. And, and look at it this way, in the big picture, if we continue to lose population in the county, I mean, I think we went under a million. That has that has implications for representation and tax and money's coming back right. in terms of congressional seats, in right. terms of uh, the big picture. And we can't continue to go on that way. And the only growth that came, it was could have been greater, came from the immigrant communities. And you can quantify the contributions of the community in terms of eco economics or the economy, talk to your chamber of commerces, the, the Asian chamber of commerce, the, the, the Hispanic chamber of commerce, 
Uh, Jeffrey is the founder of, uh, of the African Chamber of Commerce. That can be quantified and that's all good. And when you look at currently who some of the big players are, I know there's a there's there's quite a few Latinos at Centene. Who owns the companies right now? You have you have Anheuser Busch that's owned by uh, uh, InBev that is all that that is owned by the Portuguese. You you have you have uh, 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 top executives. Uh, entrepreneurs in, in, in STEM related and biotech and everything who are foreign born or are ethnic uh, people. So it's, it, it, I, I think if, if part of this is to raise up the reality that we are major, major players in the economy and the life of St. Louis County. I agree wholeheartedly. And I would add to that, uh, as do you have more inviting, more welcoming plan, the word will spread. I, I'm going to borrow a line from an old baseball movie called Field of Dreams. If we build a solid welcoming plan and infrastructure, they will come. And we can increase St. Louis County's population and, you know, other our tax base and things like that that we need to increase. We have to make ourselves more competitive to attract not just people from other countries, but people from other countries who are living in major metropolitan areas or attending colleges and universities across the country to make St. Louis an even more welcoming place for them. We aren't competing. We have to be competitive. It is our life. It's our life stream. It's our life jacket for the future. And can y'all both, you or are, are Betsy, speak to the urgency of now. Uh, we have Now's the time as COVID is kind of right now it's, it's manageable, but doesn't seem like we have to strike the iron right now when it's hot and we can't, we can't let this sit on the shelf for a long time that we have to act now. That pause out. You everybody still hear me? Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, I, I think the answer is that, um, just like Jason Hall has talked about the region, we are slipping down from, we're gonna, as a region, we're gonna go from 21 to 30. I mean, we are just, um, the time is now if we truly wanna change this. And it, it's, it, there's a plan um, through the International Institute to attract Afghans from around the country to move here. There's a million three that's been put toward that as well as other support. We've made recommendations, several people have made recommendations to the county executive. Um, to do more to help with um, Afghan encouragement and programming. The um, just are putting together a plan for more Hispanic attraction, but we can explain for people why they would like to live here. But when they come, when they try to use services of our government, um, if they don't see anything there that uh, that really um, walks the talk, I can attract people. I'm a marketing person, but when they then go to get a license, when they go to get their, you know, information about what they need to do to, uh, to, to do their taxes, to get their government forms, to go to the health department. Um, and the health department is, is, you know, has tried and has worked with a lot of collaborations that we just don't have it all together when people go through our government and they don't see people that look like them, they don't have materials. So we're attracting, but it's the ability now to get people to wanna stay here and feel like the region is committed to to doing it, and it's also true that a lot of young white and black people want to live in a more diverse community, and that's why they're leaving as well because we don't have that multicultural community that you see when you go to some other places. So, you know, government is one of the key pillars of it. You know, industry, faith, universities, all these things are are different pillars, but the government pillar has um, not had this come to the front, even though it it bubbles up and then it it, it falls away. And I'd like to add to that, that we need to also do a much, much better plan with our ethnic communities who have been here for a while, uh, who are not, uh, are, are missing from the table. Your, your Latino, the Bosnian community, for example. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a large community. So we have to work some, do some work with the community that lives here now and use that as the, 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 use that as a part of the welcoming community. We have to be welcoming community to the community that lives here already before we can 
you seriously think about making that the the, the jump to being a major I, I just yeah and i'll give another example i mean is jeffrey going to be is jeffrey on to, to speak yeah he's I, on. I, he's I don't want yeah. I, I don't want to cut into his time but i will say for example when boards come to, to me and they say you know we're looking to have a more diverse board they talk to me they explain what they're looking for for key roles when people are hiring they come to me and they say we're looking for people with these skills and you know and i hand pick them we hand nominate people we put people forward based on well, who we know has the right skills to fit certain jobs to fit certain boards to fit certain leadership we don't just go send them through um i guess the the masses you know when you have no, you know you can go through trusted people who can bring forward the right people and you can ask the Jeffries and the Sal's and they know who to recommend for jobs so that you end up with a better diverse, you know, pool of candidates or whatever it is. So again, you have to be intentional. And if you're trying to get, you know, if you're looking for Bosnians to be on a commission or if you're looking for a more diverse slate to fill a job, it's not just the fact that the county has posted the jobs. It's have they been on the Hispanic job site? Have you posted them with Mosaic? You know, I mean, I can put a link to the county website, but jobs, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it doesn't, no one's going to like act on it because it doesn't feel authentic or there's a, a real intent that someone wants to see them as a viable candidate. Doesn't mean they're going to get the job, but even to bring them forward as candidates. So again, I want to leave Jeffrey his time. All right. Well, thank you, Sal. You can unshare your screen now. And speaking of Mr. Jeffrey Soliente, uh, are you there, Mr. Soliente? You can unmute yourself because you'll be speaking next. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you very much. Sal's going to unshare his screen. Uh, and then I uh, want to present to the floor to speak Mr. Jeffrey Soliente from Videto for Africa. Yeah, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm just listening to the conversation and I, I'm like, yes, uh, the the following up from uh, Betsy and following up also from uh, Sal, I think uh, they've really touched very important points. Uh, maybe I may be repeating a couple of them, but I don't want to repeat because I think it's really the same thing. When you talk about uh, uh, the way to build St. Louis a welcoming uh, region is actually to focus on those key areas that I mentioned, uh, including the language language access. Um, and and also like uh, the conversation people you people talk about, uh, I think people have a very negative. They always get all the negative uh, information about immigrants uh, in terms of what the media maybe talks about. But I think uh, the story of positive, the positive stories is something that I think maybe as a region, including St. Louis, uh, uh, to be intentional, to be able to highlight the great uh, value that immigrants brings to the region. Uh, because the negative Kind of, if there's nothing is being told, then the, what people kind of rely more is that what the media portrays. Uh, but but I think uh, we we may have to be very intentional to highlight uh, all these uh, great things and value that uh, immigrants bring to, to the region. Uh, like uh, Betsy mentioned that uh, even uh, the uh, the staff and uh, people in the city or uh, in the county uh, being involved actually more in the community. Uh, I think. Uh, had uh, did uh, attend at some of our forums, and and I, I want to make sure people in the audience know that uh, we have somebody from St. Louis County who is also in the audience listening to our conversation. Um, so uh, the, the when you think about it, is that small things that maybe we take it for granted that really may, makes a big makes makes a big difference. Um, and the way I say is that. Uh, uh, I, I think this the education part of it is very important across the board. And uh, mentioning that uh, immigrants are just like a seed uh, that needs somewhere to, to, to germinate, need a garden to germinate and be able to pursue, produce, give up enough produce. And uh, we have to create and prepare that garden, uh, which is our region to be ready for work for any, for those seeds when they come in, then we are able to help them to produce because uh, immigrants brings a lot of resilience and uh, with that, they are able to adapt to different uh, environment. They are able to be creative. They are very entrepreneurial. So giving them that platform uh, uh, will be the best way actually to not only just to attract them here, but also to make them stay here. 
because uh, it, it's just like friendship. You can make friends, but keeping friends is the most important part and so the hardest part. Uh, you can have a list of them, but the same way we can have many immigrants coming in, but the idea of keeping them here is something that I know we have to be intentional and they have to go out of our way to make sure it works. Um, we, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, immigrants as, and I think statistics shows that population is growing, especially the African population is actually growing, but uh, we need to tap a good share of that and keep them here in the region. Um, and, and I will say that uh, uh, there is a research we did last year uh, within the African community and uh, out of the, the participant, we real 70% of the participants uh, say identified uh, that uh, uh, community-based organizations becomes their biggest source of uh, information and where they actually trust to work with them. Um, that means if these small organizations, the community-based organization, the community that are already on the ground that works with this community, they understand the challenges they go through, they understand the opportunities that are there. If they're not well uh, equipped uh, with the right information, then the population that they, are, they serve will not be able to uh, grow or may not be able to feel connected. And, and building those network, I think, uh, which uh, a good example, I'll say, even during the COVID, uh, I know the county did a lot of work uh, during the education and vaccine awareness. But I think when I when we look at the impact that a small organization that uh, while on the ground, like uh, V4A and other organizations, uh, we made a great impact because we're able to reach people to uh, where they trust the information, they trust the people you work with, you're with them every day. If it's Sunday, it's a Monday, whatever it is, a bad day that they're having, you're within the community. And, and I think building on those strengths because uh, as community sense of community is a big thing when it comes to why immigrants move to a certain location. Uh, I've shared a couple of times where, and I think it was last week I was in St. Charles, uh, where I've had, I've had people travel, move from other states and come to St. Louis, simply they want to, to, do, to enjoy, because they want to enjoy the benefits or the resources that we're able to provide within the small network that we reach. Meaning if we're able to equip and uh, improve the capacity of these small organizations that are directly involved with immigrants, then uh, we will be able to attract and retain more people. And uh, as many of uh, the Betty and uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sal mentioned, is that uh, most of these immigrants, yeah, you actually just need to help at the basic level when they just get in. And after some times, they now become heavy, uh, uh, large contributors and taxpayers because most of them they start business. Some of them, are, most of them are educated and. Uh, and now we have tried to highlight the the impact of uh, professionals that are making it, what are making the region. We have a lot of doctors, we have a lot of nurses. Right now, uh, there is a campaign of the, the pandemic. Uh, a lot of uh, health, I mean, the healthcare industry was really affected because of the shortage of the staff. Now, uh, many of them are actually now sourcing nurses from. Uh, from outside the country. And uh, we've actually set to help so many of them that have been uh, coming directly from Africa to BJC, Massey Hospital, St. Louis University. And when they come here, we want also to, con not just them to get a job, but we also want to have them some connection with their community. And, and, and that has helped them to feel that at least this is a place they want, this is a place they want to stay. So building those, Strength and 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 uh, and in, and and the the the, the county actually be like creating that pre their presence in the community. Uh, when we have all these uh, events going on, there is uh, multicultural events. Uh, we have always uh, been an advo advocate for schools to be able to host those multicultural nights, uh, festival of nations events, the passport nights, uh, because that's also helped the students to feel that they're part, they're welcome, and they're part of the school. And if the kid is not happy, is is, is satisfied and is 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 comfortable at school, then the most likely the parents want to stay in that area. They want to stay in that school district, 
and and then become they become the heavy uh, contributors of the of the of the of, of the of the economic growth in that region. So um, I think my my other part I would say that uh, a city that is uh, strongest a, a city is very strong when all the residents are engaged in civic life. However, immigrants community face more barriers to civic participation than other groups, such as uh, difficulty in uh, English language, lack of social connectivity, uh, misinformation about naturalization and meaningful uh, of, of citizenship. Building those networks helps actually to grow uh, the region. Um, the other part maybe I want to say is that uh, I think there is a quote but some by uh, Robert Padman. He says, when we often when we often think of diversity as a good in and itself, but diversity is hard. Ethnically diverse a neighborhood tend to build to to hunker down and develop lower beliefs and trust. To turn around these states of affair takes deliberate effort. It doesn't it it just doesn't happen by itself. That we things don't happen. People make things happen, and I think that is why the previous speakers mentioned we have to be intentional. Uh, to build a very welcoming city uh, by actually being uh, connecting and uh, addressing some of those uh, challenges that uh, immigrants face when they, they they try to settle in a certain area. We need to build some mentorship program that helps those uniform fam families that are coming in. They are professionals. They want to pursue different career and different uh, uh, profession where they worked in, and they need a platform to build that. We need to build that. We need to have. Uh, uh, like Betsy mentioned, uh, some community culture lies on that work within between the government and also the community they work with. We want to feel at least they are represented. They have people that they know. They understand the challenges. Um, we, I think I can mention I can emphasize about having different languages. Uh, I mean, materials or resources that are translated in different languages. Uh, that's the only way that people, even if we have people speak English. I do speak English, but when in a forum we're able to speak a Swahili conf, uh, conversation, the message that I get is more well, it, it has more weight than just uh, being able to have in, uh, somebody speak in English. And, and also encouraging some uh, um, uh, multicultural, uh, or I mean, um, cultural competency training, especially in uh, service, different service providers in healthcare. Uh, or even uh, different areas, uh, be intentional and also providing, encouraging those conversations where the staff are able to participate and uh, at least embrace way to uh, different ways to learn and 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 how to interact and uh, learn from different cultures. Um, I think. Uh, okay, could I ask you before you move away from the community piece, if if you would, um, do you have a sense that representatives of St. Louis County are are out in the communities of of not only the African community but beyond people that you see. Do you, do you know that there are people from St. Louis County who are um, who are up maybe and maybe maybe more of the Department of Public Health than anything else or no? I think Department of Mental Health has opened up and, uh, and especially during the uh, the COVID, uh, we really were able to connect. Uh, with uh, the team, especially uh, through uh, Damon, um, uh, and and I think also mm, it helped also to help people know more about the services that are available through the Department of Health. Uh, and there is a room for improvement. Uh, there is a room to be able to improve on that. But I think uh, there is, a, I can say, there is a great progress that we've seen over the last two years. Okay, thank you. Um... And how and what do you see are the patterns with the African community? Let's say in the next few years, what do you expect? Which countries are going to be um, more prominent than others, or will it be a, a variety of broadly coming from the continent? I think it is uh, the way I mentioned. Sometimes you find a certain group of a country. Some countries are more concentrated in some area; others are than others. But I think it's because that of uh, the sense of community. If you find like uh, the Somali, they are more in uh, uh, Nebraska because there is a big connection on that. 
uh, what is what I've seen it also is building those uh, small community around St. Louis, and even if it's a small community from from whatever countries, and we build on that. Uh, this Saturday, I have a meeting, a breakfast meeting with all the community leaders from different countries. I think we have around 16 of them that are coming from different countries, and we want to empower them with the right information. We want to empower them with the right resources so that they can be able to help their community. And if we build that, I think uh, we will be able to have a very diverse population moving into St. Louis. Thank you. I like what you said about cultural competency because I think that's very important. Uh, Africa is a continent, and sometimes people don't view it as a continent. They almost use it in the contact like it's a nation. The same thing I feel about when people use the term Asian. Uh, the term Asian describes 90 something, maybe 100 different cultures, but we tend to just clump and push people uh, into clumps that don't necessarily fit. Uh, them perfectly and being more cultural competent, I think is a burden of government, but I think also it's a burden of us to go into the community and teach people how to be more culturally competent and realize that we have very wise doctors and nurses coming from all over Africa to help our community. We have uh, different uh, immigrants from coming all over the world and not only should we welcome them, but we should see them for how they self-identify, not for how we want to push them in certain groups. Do you agree with that? I, I do agree with that. that, that I think we, 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 I really am passionate about uh, building the cultural competence. Like I mentioned, we have nurses who are just coming directly from Africa, whatever it is, and they go straight to um, working station. And, uh, and some of those people who are their bosses, their head charge nurse, uh, they have never been able to get, they've never connected or maybe interacted with these uh, uh, people or from different countries, but having a way that they are really more, not just their boss or their supervisors, but they are really, they've made a little effort at least to understand some, to build some cultural competency in a way to know how to work with them. I think it will make that staff to be more productive than if they are, I mean, they're just getting in an environment where they don't feel really more welcome. I think uh, we, that's how we have, I feel we need to be more intentional on that. Agreed. And you said something about passport nights. Can you tell me a little bit more about what's a passport night? What is that? What is that? I can tell you too, yeah. I, I love that because I've seen some school do that. They will do like uh, passport nights and we've done that in Hazelwood, we've done in Parkway, we've done it uh, Rockwood. I think on, we, we built in Rockwood this Friday. Uh, passport night, they just get students uh, when they come in, they're given a small book that has all different uh, countries uh, and they, they have a stick. So the, every booth they around uh, in the hall, uh, it represent a certain country. So when you go there with your booklet, they will stamp and put a sticker. And, and, and at the end of the day, when you have all the, you, you find the student has visited all these different countries and every station they visit, they learn something about that country. Oh, so it's real exposure building because exactly. a lot of students- often, Yeah, often, the, often there are family members, families from, that represent those cultures that man the booths and do different things. But, you know, you'd be surprised, um, for example, um, a number of the Parkway elementary schools are, are white minority now. Uh, they are color majority um, of a, with a range of cultures. But a number of the schools in our ambassador schools have, have come to us. And so, for example, they find through their PTO that the pancake breakfast isn't working anymore. It's like, well, you need breakfast around the world. They, they, their trivia nights are not working and they're moving to having geography nights, spelling bees. I mean, all sorts of things that um, appeal to a broader group than what the old mindset would be. And we're seeing it from Rittner, Hazelwood, Pattonville, Parkway, Ladue, um, Clayton, then, then down Afton, Bayless. I mean, oh, so many of the schools, they're living it and they're looking for ways to lean in to what their new populations want so that they can keep growing. And then they need to find ways to bring um, those members from those communities into the mainstream. So again, I, I would recommend, and certainly for the county, having staff and hiring is harder, but you could 
fill the, you know, if you said that we have certain jobs that have these skills and you say to Jeffrey, which candidates can you put forward into our process? Um, that can help. Even things like Jeffrey's had a fabulous uh, series of professional speakers from the African community. And part of that is to build up the knowledge within the African community, but then also he can provide speakers to other things that you are doing and you can highlight them. Even when you do a panel like this, the next time, if you put Jeffrey's name on it, that the county is doing it, and Jeffrey Soyatent from Batendo for Africa is a speaker and Sal Valadez is a speaker, you as the county get the credit for highlighting these people and their communities. And so, you know, you have an opportunity when you, so for example, the, the materials for tonight, they didn't list them. It didn't show their pictures, it didn't list them. And next time when you bring these people who are diverse and you've got a Bosnian speaker or someone from our Vietnamese community, put their names and faces. And because that gives that, um, it shows the connectivity because you've met them and you're connecting, even if they haven't been hired by you, you can um, form, a, form a stronger connection and their communities will want to see them because if they had seen Jeffrey's face on that flyer, a number of them might have come on to this webinar to hear him and to add their voices. But when they don't know and see, it feels like they're not at the table. Um, and well, as Carolyn said, that. you know, that, that's an opportunities. Thank you. No, for I, agree. I agree. That That is very true. Uh, the message uh, that uh, you communicate through the social media, it is very powerful because mm -hmm. people see that and they, there is a lot of interpretation that they do that. It has a lot of message that is communicating just by the, the, the you, uh, the county saying that we did this, or we, 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 we're gonna do this with this particular group. Uh, it, it has a very big message that is able to communicate. Isn't and it also about this? a trusted communicator? Like when we put your faces up there, your community yes. knows you and trusts you, and therefore can we can finally get the good information we want to the community because your voice and your face is there. Yes, Absolutely. I think that's the point that Bessie was making. Yeah, and it. so use after it. this, we'll be able to share this to, yeah. you know, all of our platforms. I Good. wanted to bring our attention to some of the questions that Carolyn left in the chat box because she okay. said that she had um, some audio issues and part of it, part of her questions or some of her questions relate to ARPA. But what percentage of county ARPA funds have gone to communities of color with ethnic breakdowns. Then she says, I ask that all tonight's questions and testimony be added to the testimony about how the county should spend the remaining ARPA funds as opposed to having us duplicate work and time. She goes down to say, there are populations who are not represented. There are populations who are not represented at tables that have been mentioned. She also said, I have been trying to, I have been having conversations with high level officials at federal agencies. Looking for her name again. And the fifth one is HHS administrators. I'm sorry. Did you say something, Kenny? You're on mute. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just seeing it myself. And I can go ahead and read it. HHS. S administrators has said that there are millions being spent on mental health funding. 70% of Asian American oh. women have experienced racism in the past year, yet we remain invisible, not even an afterthought. It is about three weeks after the anniversary of the Atlanta spa shooting. Oh, well, she said she had to leave too, but I think she brings up a really good point uh, that we, I think what, what you were saying, being invested in the community also keeps our ear to the communities. So when the communities feel pain, we can hear it up firsthand. And I think there has been a lot of pain in the Asian American community, considering the last top-down administration used certain words and phrases that I think were inappropriate. I'm not gonna repeat them, but they were inappropriate. I think they hurt people uh, or put the wrong paradigm upon different citizens. Uh, and so I, I do think that's important. I do that think that's important that we acknowledge that many Asian Americans, especially young Asian Americans in school, have gone through a very challenging, difficult year when they've been called all sorts of things. We must continue to protect our, our citizens. Kenny, I think I think this goes a little deeper though. 
Good. I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I, Caroline is wonderful. I work closely with her and we've had this ongoing concern. And I believe Jeffrey, I don't want to speak for you or Betsy, but. Here's my perspective earlier. I said, we needed to, you know, suggesting that we do an inventory. Of what diversity inclusion and equity means at the county. In terms of hiring and hiring practices. And what Caroline, I believe, is trying to say here is how much of those monies are being used for what purposes. And you use the COVID and the opioids pandemic. I mean, the state of Missouri has set has spent $66 million. How much of that money was spent directly in community supporting nonprofits? direct service providers, et cetera, for outreach and advocacy. Uh, uh, and I think that's what she's getting at, is that as you move forward, I think you're going to lose our trust if you don't address the issues of how money tax dollars are spent in our communities or not. And, and it's been my experience that that those are questions that are always kind of left unsaid and were diverted to another topic. We need, we need funding. We need support. I mean, if you can, if, if you can afford to bring people from outside of the community, uh, 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 contractors, I mean, I can go on with stories about how dealing with contractors, they had no clue, absolutely no clue about our communities. And I had a case where I was actually in a position where I had to train the contractors who were getting paid to do diversity and outreach out to the Bosnian community. And they were not, and they they were, you, the, I was brought in as a friend of the Bosnian community. I'm not Bosnian, I'm Latino, but I have a relationship with the Bosnian community. The question for me was, where is the county relationship with the Bosnian community? And why aren't, it's frustrating. I, can I, I think that, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't. If I may, Karen, if I may, Karen, let me just finish things. my thought. Oh, just sure, let me finish my Go thought. Ahead, so I'm saying we have to have an analysis, a realistic analysis and data about these issues that you're hearing, because it's not just us who are here tonight, it's the community in general asking those questions. Right, right. It, you know, look, part of the challenge is that by ordinance, the minority and women business enterprise standards are um, set as a floor uh, to reach 24% of all uh, contractors the primes need to reach 24% in the course of a year when it comes to minority business, and I think 9.5% when it comes to women-owned uh, enterprise. Those are floor numbers, not ceilings. So the idea would be that would be the minimum, and we would try to achieve far beyond that. Um, part of the challenge is that the current procurement process is uh, so drastically difficult to get through that part of what we need to do um, that will make the county more welcoming is to um, streamline it significantly um, and make it more accessible, both in terms of language access, but just in terms of uh, prime contractors being able to find subs who will help fulfill those requirements. The minimum requirements that primes are required to do, and you in some ways know this better than I um, uh, from your background, to make a good faith effort to find people who can fulfill the requirements of a particular contract that might be necessary. Sometimes there are, um, uh, let's call them less than good faith efforts made on the part of the prime community to make those numbers happen. And so we have to be more intentional um, in that area. And I think that the, the combination of that with a more, I mean, look, the, the, the county's MWBE program is finally fully staffed for the first time. Let me say that differently. The county's MWBE effort is finally fully staffed, period. And it is operating under a new set of rules that just went into place last summer. 
And I think it's anticipated that it will be a much more successful operation. Um, and I, I am trying to pull that office into more intentional um, engagement with folks like you and Jeffrey and Betsy and the Hispanic Chamber and um, the International Institute and anybody else who can help us cast a wider net. Um, and I think in addition, we need to find the allies who can help us uh, liaison to those uh, subcontractors, the smaller business folks who do have the unique subsets, um, the skills to be able to fill some of those more narrow um, subcontracts that need to be part of the broader, uh, the prime contracts. So I think yeah. there's all of that has to happen as well. Um, I think it's it's all the layers. I mean, it's the structural uh, piece of all of it. Um, and it all has to happen all the time. Karen, um, that won't work. That won't work when we're talking about pandemics and epidemics, when, as we've been talking along all throughout this conversation, right. it's trust, community engagement, and collaboration. You cannot collaborate with non for profits who are often at 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 a dollar away from losing their from losing being able to do their work because they don't have the capacity. The subcontracting and the MWE process does not function for those uh, for the nonprofit sector. Oh and no, so I understand that. No, and, no. And, and, I... and so there has to be. A, we're talking about the whole picture. Right. The, yeah. The, the what you just said is very important, and I congratulate you for moving that direction. But the other part of the discussion is true collaboration right. and funding for nonprofits in our communities. Yeah, Thank I'm you so sure. much. Can I um, just mention something real quick? We have two more panelists and I just oh, want, okay. want to make sure that they right. have time to enter sure, their go information. Ahead, Sorry. Yes, well, oh, yeah, you can go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Up next is, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Joffrey Soliette uh, for that presentation. And uh, we heard you loud and clear. Very good presentation. Up next is Liz Warner with I Help STL. Uh, Liz, are you there? Yeah, hey everybody. Um, my dogs just decided to start wrestling loudly underneath me, so I'm sorry if you hear them. <laughs> it's all in good fun. No. Uh, my name is Lizzie Warner. I am the program manager at Immigrant Home English Learning Program, and um, I'm also the chair of the Language Access Committee for ISPN. So that's been mentioned a few times on this call, but the Immigrant Service Providers Network, um, Aruna and I, she's the other presenter and I both work together on that committee. So um, we're happy to be here tonight and to connect with you all. Um, I'll keep mine fairly short. I do feel like a lot of what I have has been really well put and mentioned by the other presenters tonight. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight, because I came to this meeting last month too, and last month the focus was a little different and I really appreciated being in that space and being in this space with all of you because I think we've all seen probably in our own lives, but also just in our work that um, people in power like to keep marginalized groups apart. And so when we're all together and have a collective voice, um, we really make a lot more impact. So I'm glad to be here with everybody. Um, one really big part of ISPN's language access committee this year and going forward is helping to encourage St. Louis City and County to create language access plans. So um, like people have mentioned, Title VI does require that if you receive federal funding, you have a language access plan. Um, and St. Louis County does not currently have one. The city just recently rolled theirs out. There are definitely um, some bugs to figure out in their plan, but um, you know they just got theirs going and we really want to encourage the, the county as well, um, which I know is why they invited us all here is to talk about that. Um, so we really want to encourage interpret interpretation and translation services. Um, and like people mentioned, it's a legal issue, but um, in order to be a welcoming city, we want to provide those, those resources for people. When they come here, they want most people come here and I think Kenny you mentioned that yes there is kind of a a misconception of immigrants and immigration sometimes and all the people I work with in my organization um, everybody wants to be a, a contributing member of our of our community and that means getting jobs and being able to access government services paying taxes 
sending their kids to school, all of those things that we all want to do as well. Um, but they can't do that without language access. And so um, one thing our committee has been working on is we have a phone tree and we're calling different state, city, county, city and county numbers um, to see what their what happens when you need to request an interpreter. So an example, I called the St. Louis County Collector of Revenues office, asked for an interpreter. She said, oh, we're not able to provide that. And she was very nice about it, very polite, but um, there was no options, no advice, no anything. And so if somebody calls and they want to pay their property taxes, right? They got something in the mail in English that they don't understand and they call the number and they can't get an interpreter. So what do they do? Um, I called the Medicaid expansion line. The phone line was all in English. I got a phone call back strictly in English. Um, so there's definitely these big um, gaps in that accessibility. And um, as service providers, I think we sometimes reinforce this issue because our clients come to us and say, oh, I reached out to this organization. I, they couldn't understand me. There was no interpreter. So we go with them, right? And we provide that. And like Sal was saying, most of us are at capacity. And so we will go above and beyond. We are already overburdened, but we're doing that extra step for the people that we work for and work with. And um, it creates this cycle because then government staff thinks, oh, there's no need for interpreters because people bring their own with them. Uh, and we're over here thinking, oh my gosh, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> like we've already, you know, got our full days, our weeks, our months. And so it creates this cycle. And um, I think we, you know, we wanna break this cycle. We want to encourage trust and accountability between the residents of the county, the county government service providers and the government also, um, and really all work together. So that's what we're here to do and to encourage um, as far as recommendations. Um, you know, and I'm hearing capacity issues on all ends. Um, and our recommendation is to contract with an organization that does translation and interpretation, um, train staff that are in those offices answering those phones to know how to get interpreters on the line, to have important documents translated and easily accessible, um, and just help people. We all want to be independent. We want to feel like we have a sense of control over ourselves and our lives sometimes. And that's all our foreign born neighbors want as well. So giving them those ways they can access that is a, a huge help. Um, so yeah, that's all I've got for you tonight. <laughs> if I could ask, are, have you contracted with the city formally as part of their language access program? Uh, we have not. We worked with them as um, Mayor Jones's office created their plan. Um, and then they made a contract with um, an organization called All Access Interpreters. And so they trained their staff on that. They got some, or they're getting some high touch documents translated and easily accessible. And they have these little I speak cards. So if somebody goes to an office and you know can't communicate with the person, they can point to the language. There's over 90 languages on that form. Um, there is a, uh, an issue though that some people um, you know, they speak a language, but they might not read and write in their home language, their first language. And so they're, you know, it's not a perfect system, but it's, um, that's, that's the steps they're taking. Again, there are bugs to be figured out. It is, their system is not working perfectly at the moment. I wanted I, to know if Arona had anything that she wanted to share with, since she had, she's on the call. Yeah. Her, she's on mute. Uh, you're muted, Arona. I apologize. <laughs> um, I know I listened to all the speakers and I agree with all of them. And I'm here to give an anecdotal because I think data are there, but you don't get the stories. If you get the stories, you realize what is happening to people's lives, literally. And I'll give you my example. When I came in this country, I came in, a, uh, Im talking about Im immigration, Betsy talked about it. Uh, immigration, we need to focus on immigration because when I came here, I'm fully skilled. I could work. Government wouldn't let me work. I could have done that for seven years. I could not work. So that really the contribution the immigrants make, and particularly uh, I'm going to emphasize on women because women get the bottom of the totem pole of everything. You know, as such women, and then the immigrant women because they don't speak English, but they are skilled, they are intelligent, and they can work. 
and they can provide for their families. So when, the, when, when uh, immigrants come, whether they come voluntarily, they come as refugees, they come as asylees, whatever it is, they initially need the support that we need to provide as a government. We need to provide. If you give them that, if they give them the fishing pole, they will fish at some point and will contribute back to the community. And this is the this this has to happen because they are the ones who are asking, requesting help, and they are not getting it. So if the government will, I won't say spend, I would say invest. I would say invest, invest in these people, these families, because the family family businesses in this country. A lot of them are immigrants who are running them. And so initially when we come here, we could not bring a lot of money. We can't. Our governments won't let us bring a lot of money into this country. So if you don't have a lot of money and you're starting your career, you don't have. That's when they need the government help. They need the help. And once they get that help, they get on their feet, you don't know how much they will contribute back. They will contribute double. And so if Missouri wants to get this refuge, whatever immigrants, however they come, the refugees come here because they are asked, they, are, they don't choose, they come here, they're chosen, they come, their city is chosen by the government. So if they come here and if we want to keep them, like Betsy said, you know, we need to provide them the services and we need to provide them 100% of services, housing, education for their kids, all those things have to be provided. If you put this in place, what I'm saying is that these immigrants will not will return it with twice as much. And so trusting that. And then the second thing is I, I believe is cultural sensitivity. We need to have some sort of a cultural sensitivity where people are coming from. Respect their cultures. We don't have to practice them, but we have to respect them. We have to respect their cultures, whatever their cultures are. I have worked with the court system here in the St. Louis County on the language access. Let me tell you. Um, as as we, are, we know that Title VI requires us to have the language access plan if you are getting federal money or if you are working with an agency that is getting federal money. The language access plan they had was a two page plan. If, when, if, when were you when were you working with them and, and in what language access, uh, creating a language, uh, looking at the language access plan for the Singles County Court System? Yes. And how and when did this start? I'm, I'm oh, asking you because I I was on the St. Louis uh, Domestic Violence Council. Okay. Uh, I've been on that council for a long time, and we took upon that that we need to look at the language access in the okay. courts. So if the immigrant is going in there, how does she or he understand? First thing, the language is a problem. Second thing, even if you are language proficient, even me, I would not understand the system itself because I come from a country where the system is different. So you got two layers of challenges there for for the clients, for the people who are seeking help from the courts. So what I feel is that even the simple languages, like if there is a fire in this building, how are you going to get out of here? Those are not put in other languages. And I know we don't have perfect, and we don't have to have a perfect language access. We we can work with what we have and improve as we go along. I don't think we have to wait till we have a perfect language access plan to work. You can start working and then look in, you know, look at your plan every year and say, what are we missing? So the ideal thing would be to have the staff, uh, you know, speaking in different languages. That would be the ideal thing for any, any agency or any nonprofit or any business. Well, it may not happen because the skills that may not be there. So there is a, there, there's a complexity there, you know, there's a, the, uh, why would a business hire somebody who just picks a language and doesn't have the skills? Yeah, you want that. But what I feel is that um, slowly, first of all, to have the, if you don't have that, then have the interpretation service, go to the second phase, second plan. It may not be the ideal plan, but they have something. You have to have, and we start with interpreters. And what I would like to say to you is that agencies that are providing interpreters, we need to make sure they have qualified interpreters to print interpret. You can't just say anybody who just speaks the language and make them interpreters. They have to go through some sort of a training. And I would like to see the, the government putting some sort of a, um, what do you call, um, uh, be a, be a um, monitoring system where you make sure that the interpreters that are used are qualified. 
there's a code of ethics that they should follow. So what I'm saying is it has to go both ways, right? You have to make sure the interpreters are good and you have to make sure that you use the interpreters and it is required and required by law. So you have to do it anyway. So I, I feel that you don't have to be ideal. <laughs> Nothing has to be ideal. We can take the baby steps and then work from there. Second thing is that when you go in another and another immigrant communities, we don't want to go from outside and tell them what to do. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You have to get somebody from inside the community to work with you and then take that whatever we need to take into that. It could be any kind of a presentation. Have somebody from their own community present rather than we standing there and telling them, oh, this is good for you and this is not good for you. No, it doesn't work. It never works. It hasn't worked in communities in the rest of the world. It won't work here either. So what are my suggestion is that have community interaction network and have somebody with you when you want to do something in a community, have somebody from that community representative to go with you. You will have immigration communities believing in you, trusting in you to get that trust. It's very difficult to go from outside inside and say, oh, I'm going to tell you what's good for you. Or this is the program you want to set for you. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to get there what they want. It's, it's like what we do with other things. When we put, when we want to know what a program will be successful or not, we want participation from people who are we going to provide services. We want to know their necessities, their feelings, their, their back, their, what they need. We need to know the do a need assessment with them in it, not we deciding what they need. And I think that's where I will stop. <laughs> oh, thank you for what you said. And I, I, you, got a lot of ideas going. But Runa, I want to ask you something. Do you think it would be important? Uh, it was mentioned earlier, mentorship program. Would it have been helpful to you to see a woman that was also an immigrant from where you immigrated from that was successful come back and be a mentor and say to you, this is how you navigate these networks? I lost you. Oh. I lost, I lost you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. How important is mentorship from inside the immigrant community, uh, having mentors that have been successful go back and teach other mentor, other people in the community. This is how you navigate these systems. This is how you deal with court. And should right. we look for like ambassadors of the community to help other members of the community navigate through systems? Yes, it, it's it, it's very it's very good to have somebody who's seasoned immigrant be in that community, who has worked in the mainstream. Have them be the conduit for whatever you want, whatever we, you know, sometimes we have good, good intentions. I, 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 I believe that government has good intentions. I wouldn't say they don't have intention. It's the process. How do you do it? And that's where we get all confused because we, I know everybody here wants good things for immigrants. You know, we want immigrants to stay here. We want immigrants to have the, have a good life here. So they don't want to move like the Bosnians have moved into second uh, country, uh, second uh, states, you know, we don't want to do that. We want them to stay, as Betsy said, we want them to stay here. But how do you make them stay here is to use the seasoned um, um, immigrants who have been here a longer time and help let them help us get in and do the work because we all should understand that. That if you, it's like, you know, if you go in a community and how do you go in a community? You, you just show up and you're like a sore thumb. And nobody trusts you. So what do you? How are you going to get anything accomplished, right? So you play football with the kids, okay? And you get to know the families. Then you say, okay, now I know who is the who is the right person to connect with. And then you go inside. So that's the way we have to do it. We have to do it very gingerly, walking to communities because these communities are not lacking in intelligence. They are just not trustworthy. Like if you take refugees, asylum refugees, if they come from a war zone, they don't they do not trust law enforcement. It is not that they don't want to trust. It's just they come from where military and the law has already destroyed their lives. It's very difficult to get the trust. So how do we, we have to have a law enforcement that is a public people, public service, not just, uh, you know, looking at crime, but coming there and helping the communities to stay safe, you know, and create that bond, that create that relationship that they like. Then they will, uh, it, it, it's, it's human nature. You trust people that you are in connection with. 
you mentioned court and so I was just curious to um, know your your experience like and, and what are the impacts if that's not present? What have you seen and how have you helped? I have I have gone with I've gone as an advocate for my clients and I have heard advocate uh, my client telling me that there was an interpreter who was interpreting for a witness and she and and I, she had, we had our own interpreter and our own interpreter said the court's interpreter was not interpreting correctly which goes to the outcome of the cases you know outcome of a case and everybody's life is important if you go into the into the into the court and the court says ah, oh we are here to help you but you know you don't see the help i mean the none of the documents none of the filing documents are in other 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 uh, languages we are still struggling with that. We are struggling with having qualified registered or, or qualified interpreters, certified interpreters, which, which the government is supposed to have them. OSCA is the, is the, is the agency that is, governs the courts and they're in Jeff City and they are supposed to certify and register. But then why don't we help immigrants who want to become interpreters with the fees? They are so expensive that these immigrants cannot become interpreters. So it's 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 like let's let's help them. Let's help them to become interpreters who turn around and help the communities. It makes life easier. Yeah. It's, no, it's I agree with it's, you. Uh, I wanted to share that uh, example what you just shared. Uh, there was a time we had an issue with uh, uh, TB cases in the in our community, and uh, St. Louis County tried to work with. Uh, uh, with the with the families that were going through the treatment, and there was a lot of hesitant uh, from the family because they could not understand the the, the the culture and where they're coming from, and also yeah. now the community thinking that oh we're getting in this because we're immigrants, they're just doing this and mistreating us and pushing us and all this kind of stuff. So it didn't work, and the, uh, it was an issue that went actually to the city, and they were talking, trying to see how they could. Uh, so we had a meeting and uh, we called the meeting and we, we invited nurses who are immigrants who have worked in Africa. They know how they have treated treat, uh, TB in Africa and how the treat, TB is treated here. So we had a conversation and we also invited the pastors, community leaders, and we talked about the best approach. And it's until we had that conversation and uh, now we train these people, they went to the community, the nurses, the community leaders, the pastors, and talking to the people and telling them the importance of going through the medications and, and even working together and respecting, uh, trusting the information that the, the nurses that were visiting them. Uh, and it was until that time when he had uh, the conversation that now things changed. But if we did not step in, there is no way the, the county would have been, been effective in serving that community. And if they're not effective, that means the community, not only our community is affected, but the whole county is affected because as the, we open the, the spread of, uh, of, right. of TB. Tuberculosis. So building those connections and working with the people who are in the community, empowering them, uh, yes. helps them to build the trust between the government and the community itself. Right. Well, you know, I, Aruna, I really, really enjoyed your comments and it brought back memories of my childhood as an immigrant yeah. and I served as a child interpreter. And that is a terrible, terrible, heavy responsibility for a child to interpret in medical situations, banking, government, everything. And uh, ironically, in, in one of my professional uh, careers, I was the executive director of a language access to healthcare for a major uh, hospital network. And when I was the executive director, my father had a stroke. My wife, who doesn't speak Spanish, he was in intensive care. She went up to see what my mom was doing, you know, to check in on my mom and dad. And my mom was gone and she was gone for a while and she came back and, and my wife asked her, where, where have you been? I've been sitting here and dad, your dad's all alone and everything. She said, oh, well, a really nice nurse came to me and said, 
uh, you know, we have a, it asked me if I spoke Spanish. I told her yes. And she asked me to interpret my mom being the good hearted person that she is helped her. Now, I'm the executive director of language access to health care at that hospital system. And she is interpreting. Uh, I mean, so we took care of that. But the point being is that it's not sufficient to ask our wonderful workers whoever they are to use them as interpreters without having any idea of what their skill level is in very important, critical, life-changing issues and situations. Uh, and I just wanted, the, you, you mentioned the courts. The courts in the state of Missouri are mandated to have language access plans. So if you run into that situation, and see, this is the, the thing about Title VI that you have to concern about it, you know, for governments and entities that are mandated to provide those services, there is a, a risk. And that risk is, is one complaint and you have the Department of Justice coming in, voice it, uh, right. taking care of those complaints. And I work with the Department of DOJ officials based on that situation to develop this healthcare system, this, this program for, for uh, uh, an agency that provided interpreter and translation services in the Collar counties in Chicago. So, so there's a lot to talk about here, uh, but I, and I agree with you, this is not about people being indifferent to us or, or acting out of, uh, out of any other motivation other than they're just not aware. And so the level of awareness has to come up but also the responsibilities that government and in other institutions have, especially if they receive federal funding. So I really, really appreciate your comments and Lizzie's comments about what, what you all do. So thank you very much. Well, let me have a question and we do have to be respectful somewhat of time because it's 8-11, yeah. so just gonna monitor that, but I have one question I really wanna throw out there. And do you believe that too many families that are immigrants use their own children as translation services instead of a professional certified, you know, translator. Yeah, they may do that. Yes. And which should be stopped. It should be stopped. You should not have children, relatives or advocates interpreting for you. They are interpreters are independent people and they have a ethics how they work, you know, yeah. Uh, and I think the reason why they do that is because when they ask if you need an interpreter, the first thing they think that's additional cost. So most of them, they would say no, and then they would think that they would need to go with the, with the family so that they can save money. So that most likely that could be a, one of the biggest reason why they will say no. Thinking the, other reason, the other reason is entities, government and, and, and other entities that should have those services don't. And if they don't, they don't ask. And if they do, they don't ask. And because it's cost, uh, I think that's part of, uh, part of the reason. And just the cultural competence on behalf of the staff who's supposed to use those services just isn't there. So, the, so, the, so the, there's cultural competence uh, on, that has to be key to not just the availability of services, but how they are used. Right. Can I, can I bring up something, Kenny? I know we're going to close, but I guess it, it, it relates back to what Carolyn put in her notes. It relates to all these issues, and it feels like our different immigrant communities come up with the county. Uh, Karen, you're new in this role, but it's just been years and years, and it comes up, and it's almost like you know you have to beg, ask, plead, push, and then nothing happens, um, and then the trust is built is, is denied, and the Asian community, I will say when those terrible things happened a year ago, and Kenny, you were there, we had, a, we had discussions with a number of the Asian community, with you, with Vita, and there was a number of things that we said we would do, or, and that the county said we will talk to, we would have some, there were a number of things that were suggested the county might do. Peter, Carol, and I, there was never anything back to us. It didn't happen. Um, and so, you know, many other priorities come, your, you know, your days are filled, but, in the, just like the asking for the ARPA funds for all the rest, it's almost like the county needs to say, if we have money to spend, we need a percent that goes to help people who have various needs and we proactively do it. 
Whereas it feels like all the every, and I, I've been in this role now nine years, and every year there's, we need this, we should have this. And it's like, we're begging, we ask, we bring people, and then it doesn't happen. And it's like, and then the next time, who wants to be the one to go up and do it again versus county saying, we need to lean into, we have 7% foreign born and more that are in these communities. It's gonna be 10%, 15%, you know, we need to serve them, let's build it in. And, you know, and then even, you know, well, you know, language access plan is going to be too expensive. The city did it. But I know Blake Hamilton and the Immigrant Service Provider Network was very frustrated that there was no RFP put together for the county. And how many times do you go to the well and do that before you just say, I don't want to go to another meeting and do it because it's just mm -hmm. not productive. So, again, Karen, you're coming in fresh and I, I know how you think and work because you're, you know, you, you have a dedication, but I'm just telling you, you're coming into people who have now been in this for a number of years saying, you know, we're 5%, we're 7%, it's 10%, it's 15 And so it's like, when does the county proactively say, we're gonna allocate some money without people screaming and begging? So that's just what I would offer up um, to try to say, you know, we all want this together. Hear you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. We all care. And you we care do. and we care, we, we all do. Yeah, and now's the time to make proactive change and do create programs that truly serve all people living in St. Louis County. Uh, it, it's all, all of us, we need to be served by government and now. And when one thing, when there's one thing done, then people believe maybe a second will happen and then a third, you know, everything doesn't happen at once, but baby steps and then you show progress and then the next year something else. So, but we haven't seen it yet. Well, thank you. Thank you all for this conversation. And I do promise that this is the beginning of the conversation, not the end or if something's going to be tabled, but we will continue to invest in this. And Karen, do you have any uh, final words before we uh, close out? Oh, I mean, I, let me, let me think um, <laughs> how I might do this. Um, let me think. Um, it is a different time. Um, these are priorities. Um, the challenge around um, access and and really um, creating the broadest platform for people to be able to participate well in the county, mean, meaningfully and thoughtfully, um, and to reach them where they are to understand better what the services are that need to be. It hits every single department. You know, it's, it's not just language access in terms of procurement. Um, and in terms of recruitment and retention, um, it's in DPH, it's in parks and recreation, uh, it's in transportation and public work. I mean, there isn't one place that it doesn't exist. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around something more holistic. Um, Aaron, could I suggest something just for your thought? Yeah. Start with a mission and vision statement for the county. And start with there, there, because that shows the commitment and work your way out of that. But there has to be a message. There has to be a place to start. And I think getting that kind of uh, message out to the community, you have our support. You, uh, you have, you know, if I can help out in any way, I certainly. Yeah. Well, I, I know, I know where the allies are. That's not an issue. It's, it's not the allies outside the system. It's the allies inside the system. <laughs> and we will be calling on all of you uh, to continue to help us because we can't do this without your input and your expertise and your networks into the community that we need to touch. Uh, the authentic first person speaker that can speak to the community is who we need to be working with and empowering in any way we can. And that's what we're going to be looking at doing. Hey, Kenny, you're, fa you're fading. The last part was just uh, oh, sorry, right, but that's I'm just saying that's what we need to be looking towards doing. Uh, like I said, this is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. I know that my uh, boss is the director of transformation. She'll be back in town soon, and uh, she's going to look at this. And I know she wants to chime in and see what good changes we can make to really serve the citizens of St. Louis County. And I look forward to that. But we will be getting back in touch with everybody who's been on this tonight. Uh, and be working with you in the, in the near future. But tonight it's uh, eight, about 8.20 now. So I think we need to go ahead and close this program down. 
I'd like to thank you all for sharing. This has been uh, a welcoming plan. Tina, did you have a question? Uh, well, no, but since you called me out, um, I just want to thank our guests from, for being present and thank you for speaking up and speaking out. And I look forward to collaborating with all of you. Thank you. Yeah, so, yep. so this has been the HRC and the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, a welcoming plan of building uh, equity in action. So thank you all for being here tonight, and we'll soon be in touch. Everybody have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. It's a pleasure. Good night. Pleasure. Good night.